Welcome back to biology. Uh, my name is Mr. Kabuski. Uh, you're back with us to learn about ecology today. We're in section three. Uh, today we're going to be talking about biogeochemical cycles. I know that's a mouthful, but if you break it apart and think about it, bio, life, geo, we're talking about like the earth, and then chemical, obviously chemicals. So these are chemicals that are part of the earth uh, that are required for life uh, that get recycled. Obviously, that's why we call it cycled in the environment naturally. Uh, we really don't have to do anything more to them. Now, there's things that we do as the human population that can change these cycles, and that's what we'll kind of hit on today. Uh, but the important idea is, like, last time we talked about interdependence. We talked about how, like, organisms rely on one another. They have relationships, etc. Now we're going to talk about relationships that these organisms have with like some abiotic parts of their environment, but they still are required in order for the population to be successful and the environment to be sustainable. Okay, so we're going to talk about three cycles. There's a fourth one called the phosphorus cycle uh, that we're not going to have time to get into today, uh, but I will definitely post more information about it on my website so you have that available. So make sure you visit mrkabuski.com. Uh, to get that information. All right, the first one, the simplest one, uh, the one you've probably been learning about since you were in elementary school, the water cycle. Uh, let's just go through it real quick and make sure that you understand it. It's a great way to be introduced to natural cycles, natural phenomenon that occur, okay? So we've got a large body of water here on the left side of my screen. That water is heated uh, over the course of time by the sun's rays. Uh, as it gets heated, some of it evaporates, which basically means you have liquid water that goes to water vapor, and that water vapor, okay, which is less dense, will rise into the atmosphere. Now, as it rises into the atmosphere, the atmosphere is actually cooler up the higher you go. So when I cool a gas, it goes back to being a liquid, and that's known as condensation. It's the same reason that you get the little water droplets, the little perspiration on the side of your drinks uh, in the summertime. It's because that cold glass okay, has, is cooling the air around it. So as warm, moist air comes towards that glass, the vapor, the water vapor, the humidity around that, that air and that, that, around that glass cools and it sticks to the side of your glass as water droplets okay so that's condensation now as more and more water vapor gets added to these clouds and different weather patterns occur that condensation will eventually become saturated in those clouds and will fall back to the earth as precipitation now there's two different pathways we can go from here Precipitation can simply become runoff, which basically means that it pools and runs in little lakes and streams, uh, excuse me, it runs in streams and rivers into lakes and bigger bodies of water like the ocean. Uh, so basically the water stays with larger bodies of water uh, as it goes, okay? So that's runoff. The other thing that could happen is it could go through something called percolation, which is the process of the water finding cracks and crevices in the ground and actually sinking through the layers of earth eventually working their way down to the water table or what we call groundwater deep below our feet. Believe it or not, we're here in Indiana. Below our feet, uh, we are on the east coast, basically, of something called the Ogallala Aquifer, which is a like gigantic ocean of water underneath the ground. Uh, farmers, especially like in the Midwest and the Great Plains region, literally will dig down and they will pump water out of that aquifer in order to uh, like water their plants if they're not getting, uh, water their crops, excuse me, if they're not getting enough precipitation uh, in the summertime. So aquifers, again, are big bodies of water under the ground and groundwater, okay? Now, groundwater, eventually, if it were allowed to continue, will work its way, depending on how it's connected, could work its way back into these large bodies of water, and that cycle will continue. But there's one other pathway water can travel, it can actually become uptake, meaning that plants will take it up through their roots. They will use it for a process known as photosynthesis, which we will learn about in the next unit. Okay, But uh, part of the process of photosynthesis will actually release water from plants' leaves back into the atmosphere. This is known as transpiration. Okay, There's little uh, holes in the leaf uh, and leaves that allow this uh, gas exchange to occur and water to leave. Okay, so this is the water cycle in a nutshell. Now, notice we have red lines and blue lines. Blue are working their way down. Red is working its way back up. Okay, but that's pretty much all you need to know about the water cycle. Now, we're going to get into a little bit more complicated ones. Uh, we're going to go actually to the most complicated one just because it's something that you don't necessarily think about on a regular basis, and these are definitely terms you don't see on a regular basis, okay? But we're going to talk about the nitrogen cycle. Now, nitrogen accounts for a good portion, most of the air that you breathe. When I'm taking a breath right now, the majority of it, about 78% of it, is nitrogen gas. Now, I just breathe it back out. I get rid of it. I only use the oxygen that I breathe in. 
Okay, but it's there, it's all around us. And now nitrogen is needed in order to build protein. Okay, so nitrogen is a big part of, uh, of our ecology, of our environment, like it's gonna be needed by all of our organisms in order to survive. Now, luckily for us, we have different fungi or funguses Okay, and bacteria that can change the nitrogen from the atmosphere into a usable type of nitrogen here on the ground. Okay, so they literally pull it from the air to make it usable. Now, they can only do that with the help of lightning, believe it or not. Yes, lightning. This is the reason why after a lightning storm or a thunderstorm, you're going to see greener grass the next day than if it was just a rainstorm. Okay, it's because this nitrogen gas is actually fixed when lightning strikes occur, okay? And the fixation occurs, again, with bacteria usually most of the time in the soil. They will fix this nitrogen and bring it in down into the soil. So nitrogen gas becomes fixed and goes into the soil. Now, from here, this nitrogen goes through a process called, <coughs> excuse me, ammonification. And basically it's converted into something called ammonia, NH3. Now ammonia is used by different organisms for different purposes, mostly again for you take it in and then you can build proteins from it. But luckily for us, since they are taking in that nitrogen, it is now available to us. Here's how, okay? So this fungi and bacteria go through nitrification where they change the ammonia into a form that they can use, okay? And some of that nitrogen that is changed gets taken up by plants, okay? That's called assimilation. Basically what happens is it gets added in with the water that plants are naturally taking up, and so it goes up into the roots, and that's how they take in their nitrogen to build protein. Now, when we eat plants or we eat other animals that have eaten plants themselves, we then get their nitrogen. So we are dependent upon these plants, these bacteria, these fungi, you know, because of nitrogen. We need them to fix it and change it into forms that we can use. Now, so there's nitrogen in our bodies, and there's nitrogen in my digestive tract, Eventually, that nitrogen will get added back to the environment through decomposition, okay? If I was out in the woods, I go to the bathroom, nitrogen obviously gets added back to the soil, both if I go one and two, okay? Uh, or if my body were to decay in the, uh, in, the, in the environment, that nitrogen would be added back to the soil as well. Now, it's done that way. It's added back to the soil through denitrification, where you change that nitrogen that's in proteins and in different forms back into a nitrogen gas, okay? It's released back into the environment. This is why when you walk by decaying corpses uh, and decaying material, uh, you might smell some funky smells, okay? It's because of the release of different compounds like methane, which is carbon and hydrogen, okay? And then nitrogen gas, uh, what's going to give off a little bit of an odor. Uh, but again, it's really important because it adds these back into the environment. This nutrient cycle is allowed to continue, okay? So that is the nitrogen cycle in a nutshell. Now, there's one other way nitrogen gets added to the environment, and it's actually in this picture over here in the corner. If you've ever been driving, and if you're watching this uh, in the Midwest, you definitely have. If you've ever been driving through down a country road, and you're following behind a truck or a tractor that has a big, like, clear tank on the back of it with sloshing around, and it's got these big arms that kind of swing out the side of it, that tank is full of ammonia. Now, why would I add ammonia to my plants? Well, what happens is, as farmers... Okay, they, they use the land, they keep putting these plants and the crops down in it. These crops keep pulling up the nitrogen at really fast rates, faster than we can put it back in. So that's why farmers have to use fertilizers and ammonia because it adds nitrogen back to the soil, which these plants and these crops will take back in. Okay? Now, downside is you're adding extra nitrogen. If you have a dog at home, and you probably know this, if you let them go out in your backyard and go to the bathroom, and they happen to go in the same spot a lot of times, you'll notice that spot becomes bare because too much nitrogen has been added to that spot uh, and it's not been able to be recycled out fast enough and it kills off the naturally occurring plants in that spot and the grass dies up. Okay? Pet burns, as it's sometimes called. So anyways, so ammonia from farms is actually added to the environment as well here. So this is one way that humans are impacting one of the natural cycles. Okay. All right, last cycle we're going to talk about is the carbon cycle. And I know I'm running out of time, but let's get through it. The carbon cycle actually requires oxygen in order to do the process as well. And here's why. Oxygen and carbon dioxide get traded by plants and animals through processes called photosynthesis and cellular respiration. If I look at the chemical formula for photosynthesis, okay, 
It takes in carbon dioxide, water, and energy, specifically sunlight, okay, and converts it into oxygen, which is a byproduct it just gets rid of, and then glucose, which obviously is a sugar that plants need, animals need for survival, okay? If I go to the flip side, cellular respiration, it's actually the complete opposite. It's when animals take in oxygen and they eat glucose, and then they, they have byproducts of carbon dioxide, water, and then they produce energy from the process. But if I look at the two chemical formulas, they are literally flip-flops of each other. It's almost a little symbiotic relationship. I actually had a kid in my honors biology class ask me if this is an example of coevolution. It's an interesting theory. Okay, but this is going to be an important part of the carbon cycle. So carbon dioxide naturally occurring in our atmosphere. Plants will pull that carbon dioxide out to do photosynthesis. They will exchange gases with us, okay, so we get oxygen. But more specifically, plant eaters, herbivores, will eat those plants and get the glucose, get the energy from them. Now, and then there's carnivores, which eat the herbivores and get the glucose from them in order for, to survive as well, okay? So either way, we're dependent on this photosynthesis as animals, okay? Now, when we eat these things, obviously, we do processes called cellular respiration to make energy from that glucose, and a byproduct is carbon dioxide. So this right here is a cycle in and of itself, okay? But there's more to the story. As plants and animals die and decay, just like we learned about in the nitrogen cycle, their carbon, which is the, makes up the majority of your body other than water, okay, gets added back into the environment when it's decomposing. Okay? Uh, if the right circumstances occur and enough of your, we'll talk about that other picture here in a second, and enough organisms are dying in one spot and decaying in one spot over time, they could become, over millions of years, a fossil fuel, coal, natural gas, and oil. Okay? Now, what do we as humans do with those fossil fuels? Well, we dig down, we bring them up, and then we burn them in a process called combustion to do different processes, to run cars, to run factories, to, to make electricity. But one of the byproducts of this combustion is carbon dioxide. So now I've added more carbon dioxide to the planet. Now, what should happen naturally is natural processes of continental drift and tectonic plate movement and la lava and magma rotations, okay, should rotate and exchange that carbon and move it around underneath the surface of the planet. And sometimes uh, it erupts out in the form of volcanoes and lava and magma, and that actually adds more carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. So if I look at my picture, I have four arrows going up into the atmosphere adding carbon dioxide, and how many do I have coming down? Just one. The only way to pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere is photosynthesis. So as I start chopping down more trees and I, I clear out rainforest, which is a huge, huge swath of plants that exchanges carbon dioxide and oxygen for us to keep the entire planet surviving, as I cut them down, I'm literally cutting out my only way to pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Now, that may not seem like a big deal as I look at here on this animation, but we'll find out in our next section when we talk about human impacts, what impact adding carbon dioxide and not pulling it out of the atmosphere can have on our environment and our planet. Okay, so in conclusion, here's some of the terms that you're going to need to know. Again, water cycle, nitrogen cycle, carbon cycle. There is a fourth one called the phosphorus cycle, which you should know about. If you want to learn a little bit more uh, on these topics, I would suggest especially going into detail on the nitrogen cycle, finding out about nitrates and nitrites and when those start to occur. Uh, but I've really enjoyed your time. I hope you learned something. If you have questions, please feel free to contact me, jkabuski at gocathedral.com. Visit me at mrkabuski.com. Visit us at www.gocathedral.com or follow me on Twitter at Coach Kabuski. Have a great day.